model comparisons. Do you yet see the wonder, the beauty, the heavenly importance, the impact, the love of model comparisons? Well, if you are like my students, probably not. And I think that's probably my fault. This is one of those topics I recently realized I haven't gone that into depth with. So let's correct that, shall we? But first, let me review some foundational stuff. First, what is a model? A model is a representation of reality. It's going to retain the essential features of reality while ignoring the non-essentials. So in statistics, we're trying to capture the signal, the important stuff, and then ignore the noise. And the foundation of all statistics is models. Let me say that again. The foundation of all statistics is models. You know, on second thought, I think I want to say that a third time. The foundation of all statistics is models. And if the foundation of all statistics is models, the foundation of all models is the linear model. You remember what this is, right? Y equals B0 plus B1X plus B2 times X2 plus blah, 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 plus E, where blah, 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 blah can be as many predictors as you want it to be. I view statistics as the process of building and evaluating models. That's a really good definition. I like that. Maybe it should go in my textbook. And I'll say it again. Statistics is the process of building and evaluating models. Well, how do you evaluate a model? Excellent question, my young students. See, here's the problem. Statistics really sucks at determining whether a model fits good. But statistics is really good at telling you which of two models fit better. And so with that, let me introduce you to the model comparisons approach to statistics. And by the way, as I'm talking about this, I'm assuming we have nested models. If you don't know what nested models are, I'll leave a link in the description to the last video in this series on model comparisons. When we do model comparisons, we fit two different models. For example, we might fit one model that says y is equal to b0 plus b1 times x1. And then we would fit a second model that says y is equal to b0 plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2. And the only difference between these two models is that b2 x2. When we compare these models, we are then asking the computer a very simple question. How much do I improve fit when I include b2 x2 in my model? Is it worth keeping? And it turns out that's a very easy question for the computer to answer. And if you're using Flexplot, it's going to spit out five statistics, the AIC, BIC, base factor, p-value, and r-squared. And then we use those as well as visual comparisons to evaluate whether it's worth keeping that additional predictor. So that's the basic idea behind model comparisons. Now, if you're an SPSS user, I forgive you. That's really all I've got to say. But please get some help. Time is running out. Anyway, if you're an SPSS user, these are called hierarchical regressions. Hierarchical regressions are exactly, exactly, exactly the same as nested model comparisons. No difference whatsoever. So that's what model comparisons are. And it turns out that the traditional way of teaching statistics with a bunch of different tests like t-tests, ANOVA, and regression, all those tests can be formulated as model comparisons. With the traditional approach, we set up a null hypothesis where the parameter of interest is equal to zero. So like a two-sample t-test, we ask whether the mean differences are exactly equal to zero. That's what the null hypothesis is. With a model comparison approach, instead what we do is we set up one model, y is equal to b0, or in other words, we're just saying that both groups have the same mean, which is equal to b0, versus a model where we say y is equal to b0 plus b1 times group where G indicates group membership. Roughly speaking, I'm not gonna get into the nuances of that, but basically that's the idea. And then we ask the computer, does the inclusion of this predictor group improve our predictions enough to justify the added complexity? Same thing with the correlation and regression. So in a correlation, you're testing if the correlation is equal to zero, or if you're doing regression, you're testing whether the slope is equal to zero. With a model comparison approach, on the other hand, we are comparing two models that look basically the same as the t-test version. Y is equal to B0 is our baseline model, and then Y is equal to B0 plus B1X is our new model. And we're asking the computer again, does the inclusion of B1X improve our fit enough to justify adding it into the model? And once again, a multiple regression, if you are doing a traditional approach, you would test whether each individual slope is equal to zero. Well, you could just as easily set those up as model comparisons where you have, for example, a model that has y is equal to b0 plus b1 times x1 versus a model where y is equal to b0 plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2. 
And this model comparison would test whether including X2 improves the fit enough to justify its inclusion. Now, hold on a minute. If it's the same thing with the traditional approach versus the model comparison approach, why make a big deal over this anyway? You weren't wearing a hat last time. Yeah, I didn't want to mess up my alter ego's hair. Too late for that. But that is a good question. If it's all the same, why would you even make a big deal about the difference between them? Well, there's two reasons why we might favor a model comparison approach over a testing approach. The first reason is that they are not always the same. So let's look at an example. Let's say you've got a model where achievement is equal to B0 plus B1 times IQ versus another model where you're saying achievement is equal to B0 plus B1 times IQ plus B2 times effort plus B3 times SES or socioeconomic status. So in this case, your full model has two extra predictors instead of one. And so you might be interested, all right, aside from IQ, which you can't change, maybe you can change somebody's effort and somebody's socioeconomic status. And you want to see how much of an effect changing those two things might have on somebody's achievement. You cannot test that model using traditional tests. You can test whether B2 is equal to zero or you can test whether B3 is equal to zero, but you can't simultaneously test whether both are zero but you can with the model comparisons approach. Or in other words, there is no test that evaluates the combined effect of SES and effort. So that's one reason, it's not always gonna be the same, which makes model comparisons much more flexible than the traditional testing approach. Another reason why we might favor a model comparison approach as opposed to a testing approach is that model comparisons are more targeted. What do I mean by that? Oh, good question. So let's go ahead and look at this table here. In this table, I just pulled from Google, we see that this person is doing a bunch of multiple regressions. And you'll notice that for each one of these predictor variables, there is a p-value and each of those p-values is testing a hypothesis. And so for this bottom model here, for example, you have four different hypothesis tests. Well, here's the problem. If your original hypothesis was about experimental condition, then those other tests are superfluous at best. And at worst, they might invite you to p-hack. But with model comparisons, it only runs the test that you actually want to test. So what you do is you formulate your model comparisons to test the exact hypothesis you want to test. And then you compute that p-value and only that p-value, as well as the base factor and the AIC and BIC and the uh, R-squared, change in R-squared thingy, that thing. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So model comparisons are much more targeted than the traditional approach. So now you might be asking yourself, Okay, so how do I set up a model comparison? I'm going to give you four simple steps. Four steps that are written in stone by the statistical gods themselves. I'm just kidding. I made this up like 20 minutes ago. The first step to creating a model comparison is to formulate your research question. And when you are doing this, it is very important to be as specific as possible because it'll make step two much easier. So an example of something that is not specific is I think there's some association between the variables gender, socioeconomic status, heavy drinking, and an outcome depression. Well, that's not very specific. If you're just saying there's associations between these variables, that's not very helpful. Instead, you might say something like, what is the association between socioeconomic status and depression after controlling for whatever the other two variables were that I said? So that's step one, to formulate a specific research question. Step two is to convert that research question into a linear model. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to identify what our outcome variable is and what our predictor variables are from that research question. And by the way, I'm going to show you examples here in a bit. Step number three is to identify the parameter of interest because your research question, even if it has multiple variables in there, usually it's concerned with one aspect of those variables. And again, I'll show you examples of what I mean in a minute. And then four, you set up a full and a reduced model. And the full model will contain all the variables and all the terms you're interested in. And the reduced model excludes the parameter of interest. I'm going to say that again, because that's kind of important. The reduced model excludes the parameter of interest. And then what you can say is you can say, relative to my reduced model, what happens when I include this new parameter? So let's look at some examples. So step number one, let's say you are a fellow by the name of Sir Isaac Newton. If you are, you are a god to me. You are truly one of my heroes, and I hope to meet you in person one day. Did that get creepy? Yeah, it got creepy. All right, let's remember to cut that out later. So for Newton, his step one might be, does the weight of an object affect its acceleration? And you know what? The more I'm thinking about it, I don't think that was Newton that discovered that. I think that was Galileo. I could be wrong. If you know, 
tell me in the description. So that's stating our research question. Again, does the weight of an object affect its acceleration? Step number two, formulate that as a linear model. And like I said before, all we're going to do is identify what the outcome variable is. In this case, it's acceleration. And then we're just going to write that as a linear model. And then we're going to say equals b0 plus b1 times weight, which is our predictor. So that is our linear model. Step three, identify the parameter of interest. So our research question is whether the weight affects the acceleration. So the variable of interest here is weight. And the parameter of interest is b1, which is associated with that variable. And so our full and reduced models would look like this. In the full model, we have acceleration is equal to b0 plus b1 times weight. And then our reduced model is everything in the full model with the exception of the parameter of interest. So it would be acceleration is equal to b0. And that model will tell you the effect of the object's weight above and beyond any sort of acceleration due to Earth's gravitational pull. Which, by the way, if you were to test that hypothesis, if you eliminated drag from the equation, it would be zero. If you drop a bowling ball and a marble from a building, they will accelerate at the exact same rate. That's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I think it was Galileo. He's my hero, too. All right, let's do another example. So this one comes from, like, the ketogenesis diet. Is that how, ketogenesis? I think, it's, anyway, called keto. And so the keto argument is that it's not sufficient to have a calorie reduction to lose weight. It's also important the types of foods that you're putting in. According to the ketogenic theory, low carb foods will help you lose weight faster, even if you have identical calorie loss. And so let's go ahead and step one, state that as a research question. What is the effect of a low carb diet on weight loss once we control for calories consumed? Nice. Step two, let's formulate that as a linear model. And so we are going to identify the outcome variable. Here it is weight loss. And we are going to write out our linear model is equal to B0 plus B1 times calories plus B2 times low carb. Now that we have our linear model, we can identify the parameter of interest. What is our research question about? It's really about the low carbness of the diet. So if we were to rewrite this out, it would be weight loss equal to B0 plus B1 times calorie plus B2 times low carb, where B2 is the parameter of interest. And then step four, we set up our full and our reduced model. The full is going to contain the exact same thing in step three, and the reduced is going to just eliminate the parameter of interest. And so we get weight loss equal to B0 plus B1 times calories. Let's go ahead and do one more. This one's going to be a little more tricky. And we'll just start by stating the research question. Does climate affect the relationship between resource scarcity and conflict? And so we know that resource scarcity and conflict have a relationship, but we want to know whether that relationship differs depending on the climate. And so here we're going to formulate it as a linear model. And just as before, we identify the outcome variable, conflict here. And then we're going to say is equal to B0 plus B1 times scarcity plus B2 times climate. Now, because we are interested in whether climate modifies the relationship between scarcity and conflict, we are actually looking at an interaction here. So we need to add one more parameter, which is B3 times scarcity times climate. And if that went over your head and you want me to make a video about, about how to figure out if you're hypothesizing an interaction based on the language you use, let me know and I can make that video. So now that we have our model, let's go ahead and do step three and identify the parameter of interest. Since we're asking whether climate affects the relationship between scarcity and conflict, we are actually interested in that interaction. So in this case, our parameter of interest is B3. And it's associated with the variable combination of scarcity and climate. And so now we go on to step four and set up the full and the reduced model. The full model says conflict is equal to B0 plus B1 times scarcity plus B2 times climate plus B3 times scarcity times climate. And then reduce says conflict is equal to B0 plus B1 times scarcity plus B2 times climate. And so it eliminates the parameter of interest. So model comparisons are really the bread and butter of statistics, particularly advanced statistics. Here we've just been talking about simple, regular old linear models, but we use them all the time in advanced models, in structural equation modeling, in mixed modeling, in generalized linear models. So for example, if you're doing a mixed model, you might wanna know, all right, I have decided that this slope should be random, but that's gonna complicate the model. Is that complication enough to justify its inclusion? So you would set up a reduced model where you fix that slope and then a full model where you allow that slope to randomly vary. Just to summarize, 
models are the foundation of all statistics. And model comparisons are the bread and butter of statistics. And with model comparisons, instead of testing whether a parameter is zero, which is the old approach, instead we're asking the software package or the stats package if the inclusion of this added complexity, this added variable, or this added interaction effect or whatever is important enough to justify its conclusion. And just about all, if not all, of our research questions can be formulated into model comparisons. And we do that by using those four steps. First is to state clearly and what's the word I used? Specifically. <laughs> I couldn't remember the word specifically. So the first step is to very specifically state your research question. The second step is to write out your linear model that corresponds to that research question. Third step is to identify the parameter of interest. And fourth step is to set up a full and reduced model where the reduced model is equal to the full model, subtracting out the parameter or parameters of interest. So yeah, I hope that clarifies things for you. And I really hope from the bottom of my soul that that clarifies the confusion that my students have had and correspondingly the confusion that you might have had about why model comparisons are just amazing and awesome and wonderful and I love them so much. So much. I literally have dreams about model comparisons and they make me happy. That's kind of weird, but yeah, you got to love what you do, right? Anyway, I think that's all I got to say. Peace out.